Hi, everyone. This is going to be chapter one of our book, Sudeiko and the Thousand Paper Cranes. It's written by Eleanor Kerr and paintings by Ronald Hemmler. So we're going to start with just chapter one. The chapter is titled, Good Luck Signs. Sudeiko was born to be a runner. Her mother always said that Sudeiko had to learn to run, had learned to run before she could walk. One morning in August of 1954, Sudeiko ran outside into the street as soon as she was dressed. The morning sun of Japan touched brown highlights in her dark hair. There was not a speck of cloud in the blue sky. It was a good sign. Sudeiko was always on the lookout for good signs. Back in the house, her sister and two brothers were still sleeping on their bed quilts. She poked her big brother, Mashiro. Get up, lazy bones. It's peace day. Masahiro groaned and yawned. He wanted to sleep as long as possible, but like most 14-year-old boys, he also loved to eat. When he, got, when he got up, he sniffed and smelled the smell of good bean soup, and Masahiro got up. Soon Mitsui and Aiji were awake too. Sudeiko helped Aiji get dressed. He was six, but sometimes he lost a sock or a shirt. Afterwards, Sudeiko folded the belt quilts. Her sister, Mitsui, who was nine, helped put them away in the closet. Rushing like a whirlwind into the kitchen, Sudeiko cried, Oh, mother, I can hardly wait to go to the carnival. Can we please hurry with breakfast? Her mother was busily slicing pickled radishes to serve with the rice and soup. And she looked sternly at Sudeiko. You are 11 years old, and you should know better. You must not call it a carnival. Every year on August 6, we remember those who died when the atom bomb was dropped on our city. It is a memorial day. Miss Sasaki came in back in from the porch. Mr. Sasaki, excuse me, came back in from the porch. That's right, he said, Sudeiko chan. You must show respect. Your own grandmother was killed that awful day. But I do respect Oba chan, Sudeiko said. I pray for her spirit every morning. It's just that I'm so happy today. As a matter of fact, it's time for our prayers now, her father said. The Sasaki family gathered around a little altar shelf. Obachan's picture was there in a gold frame. Sudeiko looked at the ceiling, and she wondered if her grandmother's spirit was floating somewhere above the altar. Sudeiko-chan, Mr. Sasaki said sharply. Sudeiko quickly bowed her head. She fidgeted and wriggled her bare, bare toes while Mr. Sasaki spoke. He prayed that the spirits of their ancestors were happy and peaceful. And here's a picture of Sudeiko and her family uh, at the altar with a picture of her grandmother. He gave thanks for his barber shop. He gave thanks for his fine children, and he prayed that his family would be protected from the atom bomb disease called leukemia. Many still died from the disease, even though the atom bomb had been dropped on Hiroshima nine years before. It had filled the air with radiation, a kind of poison that stays inside people for a very long time. At breakfast, Sudeiko noisily gulped down her soup and rice. Masahiro began to talk about the girls who ate like hungry dragons. But Sudeiko didn't hear his teasing. Her thoughts were dancing around the peace day of last year. She loved the crowds of people, the music and fireworks. Sudeiko could still taste the spun cotton candy. She finished breakfast before anyone else. When she jumped up, Sudeiko almost knocked the table over. She was tall for her age, and her long legs always seemed to get in the way. Come on, Mitsui-chan, she said. Let's wash the dishes so we can go soon. When the kitchen was clean and tidy, Sudeiko tied red bows on her braids and stood impatiently by the door. Sudeiko-chan, her mother said softly, we aren't leaving until 7.30. You can sit quietly until it's time to go. Sudeiko plopped down with a thud onto the tatami mat. Nothing ever made her parents hurry. While she sat there, a fuzzy spider paced across the room. A spider was a good luck sign. Now Sudeiko was sure that the day would be wonderful. She cupped the insect in her hands and carefully set it free outside. That's silly, Masahiro said. Spiders don't really bring good luck. Just wait and see, Sudeiko said gaily. And that's the end of chapter one. This is Sudeiko and the Thousand Paper Cranes, and this is chapter two of our book. Chapter two is titled Peace Day. When the family started out, the air was already warm and dust hung over the busy streets. Sudeiko ran ahead to the house of her best friend, Chizuko. The two had been friends since kindergarten. Sudeiko was sure that they would always be as close as two pine needles on the same twig. Chizuko waved and walked towards her. Sudeiko sighed. Sometimes she wished that her friend would move a little bit faster. Don't be such a turtle, she shouted. Let's hurry so we don't miss anything. 
Sadeko-chan, go slowly in this heat, her mom called after her, but it was too late. The girls were already racing up the street. Mrs. Suzaki frowned. Sadeko is always in such a hurry to be first that she never stops to listen, she said. Mr. Suzaki laughed and said, well, did you ever see her walk when she could run, hop, or jump? There was pride in his voice because Sadeko was such a fast and strong runner. At the entrance to the Peace Park, people filed through the memorial building in silence. The walls were photographs of the dead and dying in a ruined city. The atom bomb, the thunderbolt, had turned Hiroshima into a desert. Sadeko didn't want to lurk at those frightening pictures, and she held tight to, to Zuko's hands and walked quickly through the building. I remember the thunderbolt, Sadeko whispered to her friend. There was the flash of a million suns. The heat prickled my eyes like needles. How can you possibly remember anything, Shizuko exclaimed. You were only a baby then. Well, I do, Sadeko said stubbornly. After speeches by Buddhist priests and the mayor, hundreds of white doves were freed from their cages. They circled the twisted, scarred atomic dome. Sadeko thought the doves looked like spirits of the dead flying into the freedom of the sky. When the ceremonies were over, Sadeko led the others straight to the old lady who sold cotton candy. It tasted even better than last year. The day passed too quickly, as it always did, and the best part, Sadeko thought, was looking at all the things to buy and smelling all the good food. There were stalls selling everything from bean cakes to chirping crickets. The worst part was seeing people with their ugly whitish scars. The atom bomb had burned them so badly that they no longer looked human. If any of the bomb victims came near Sadeko, she turned away quickly. Excitement grew as the sun went down. When the last dazzling display of fireworks faded from the sky, the crowd carried paper lanterns to the banks of the Ato River. Mr. Suzaki carefully lit candles inside of the six lanterns, one for each of the family members. The lanterns carried the names of relatives who had died because of the thunderbolt. Sudeiko had written Obachan's name on the side of her lantern. When the candles were burning brightly, the lanterns were launched on the Ota River. They floated out to sea like a swarm of fireflies against the dark water. That night, Sudeiko lay awake for a long time, remembering everything about that day. Masahiro was wrong, she thought. The spider had brought good luck, and tomorrow she would remind him of that. And this is a picture of Sudeiko and her best friend running into this, uh, the, uh, into this fair. And this is a picture of Sudeiko and her family launching the lanterns in memory and honor of her family. And that's the end of chapter two. This is the story of Sudeiko and the Thousand Paper Cranes, and this is chapter three of our story. This chapter is called Sudeiko's Secret. It was the beginning of autumn when Sudeiko rushed home with the good news. She kicked off her shoes, she threw open the door with a bang, I'm home, she called. Her mother was fixing supper in the kitchen. The most wonderful thing has happened, Sudeiko said breathlessly. Guess what? Many wonderful things have happened to you, Sudeiko-chan. I can't even guess. The big race on field day, Sudeiko said. I've been chosen the, from the bamboo class to be on the relay team. She danced around the room gaily and swung her school bag. Just think, if we win, I'll be sure to get on the team in junior high school next year. That was what Sudeiko wanted more than anything else. Here's a picture of her celebrating with her mom. At supper, Mrs. Mr. Suzaki made a long speech about family honor and pride. Even Masahiro was impressed. Sudeiko was too excited to eat. She just sat, sat there grinning happily. From then on, Sudeiko thought of only one thing, the relay race. She practiced every day at school and often ran all the way home. When Masahiro timed her with Mas Mr. Suzaki's big watch, Sudeiko's speed surprised everyone. Maybe, she dreamed, I'll be the best runner in the whole school. At the la as the last big day arrived, at last, a crowd of parents, relatives, and friends gathered at the school to watch the sport events. Sudeiko was so nervous. She was afraid her legs wouldn't work at all. Members of the team, the other team suddenly looked taller and stronger than her teammates. When Sudeiko told her mother how she felt, Mrs. Suzaki said, Sudeiko-chan, it's natural to be a little bit afraid, but don't worry, when you get out there, you will run as fast as you can. Then it came time for the relay race. Just do your best, Mr. Suzaki said, giving Sudeiko's hand a squeeze. We'll be proud of you. The kind words from her parents made the knot in Sudeiko's stomach loosen. 
They loved me no matter what she thought. At, at the signal to start, Sudeiko forgot everything but the race. When it was her turn, she ran with all the strength she had. Sudeiko's heart was still thumping painfully against her ribs when the race was over. And here's a picture of Sudeiko running the race. It was then that she first felt, the strange and, first felt strange and dizzy. She scarcely heard somebody cry, your team won. The bamboo class surrounded Sudeiko, cheering and shouting. She shook her head a few times and the dizziness went away. All winter, Sudeiko tried to improve her running speed. To qualify for the racing team in junior high, she would have to practice every single day. Sometimes after a long run, the dizziness returned. Sudeiko decided not to tell her family about it. She tried to convince herself that it meant nothing, that Disney dizziness would go away, but it didn't. It got worse. Frightened, Sudeiko ca uh, carried the secret inside of her. She didn't even tell Shizuko, her best friend. On New Year's Eve, Sudeiko hoped she could magically wish away the dizzy spells. How perfect everything would be if she didn't have the secret at midnight, she was in her cozy bed quilts when the temple bells began to chime. They were ringing out all of the evils of the new year so that the new one would have a fine beginning. With each ring, Sudeiko drowsily made her special wish. The next morning, the Suzaki family joined crowds of people as they visited their shrines. Mrs. Suzaki looked beautiful in her best flowered kimono. As soon as we can afford it, I'll buy a kimono for you, she promised Sudeiko. A girl your age should have one. Sudeiko thanked her mother politely, but she didn't care about a kimono. She only cared about racing with the team in junior high. Amidst throngs of happy people, Sudeiko forgot her secret for a while. She let the bright joy of the season wash her worries away. At the end of the race, she raced, at the end of the day, she raced Masahiro home and won easily. Above the door were the good luck symbols Mrs. Sasaki had put there to protect them during the new year. With a beginning like this, how could anything bad happen? And that's the end of chapter three. This is the story of Sudeiko and the Thousand Paper Cranes, and this is chapter four. Chapter four is titled, A Secret No Longer. For several weeks, it seemed that the prayers and good luck symbols had done their work well. Sudeiko felt strong and healthy as she ran longer and faster. But all that ended one crisp, cold winter day in February. Sudeiko was running in the schoolyard. Suddenly, everything seemed to whirl around her. She sank to the ground. One of the teachers rushed over to help. I, I guess I'm just tired, Sudeiko said in a weak voice. When she tried to stand up, her legs went wobbly and she fell down again. The teacher sent Mitsui home to tell Mr. Suzaki. He left his barber shop and took Sudeiko to the Red Cross Hospital. As they entered the building, Sudeiko felt a pang, pang of fear. Part of the hospital was especially for those with the atom bomb sickness. In a few minutes, Sudeiko was in an examining room where a nurse x-rayed her chest and took some of her blood. Dr. Numata taped tapped her back and asked a lot of questions. Three other doctors came in to look at Sudeiko. One of them shook his head and gently stroked her hair. By now, the rest of Sudeiko's family was at the hospital. Her parents were in the doctor's office. Sudeiko could hear the murmur of their voices. Once her mother cried, leukemia, but that's impossible. And at the sound of that frightening word, word Sudeiko put her hand over her ears. She didn't want to hear anymore. Of course she didn't have leukemia. Why, the atom bomb hadn't even scratched her. Nurse Yasunu Naga took Sudeiko to one of the hospital rooms and gave her a kind of cotton kimono to wear. Sudeiko had just climbed into bed when her family came in. And here's a picture of Sudeiko in the hospital with her family. Mrs. Suzaki put her arms around Sudeiko. You must stay here for a little while, she said, trying to sound cheerful, but I'll come every evening. And we'll visit you after school, Masahiro promised. Mitsui and Aiji nodded, their eyes wide and scared. Do I really have the atom bomb disease, Sudeiko asked her father. There was trouble, a troubled look in Mr. Suzaki's eyes, but he only said, the doctors want to make some tests, that's all. He paused, then he added, they might keep you here for a few weeks. A few weeks? To Sudeiko, it sounded like years. 
she would miss graduation to junior high school, and even worse, she would not be part of the racing team. Sadako swallowed hard and tried not to cry. Mrs. Sasaki fussed over Sadako. She plumped the pillows, she smoothed the bedspread. Mr. Sasaki cleared his throat. Is there anything that you want, he asked. Sadako shook her head. All she really wanted was to go home. But when? A cold lump of fear grew in her stomach. She had heard that many people who went into this hospital never came out. Later, Nurse Yas Yasunaga sent uh, the others away so that Sadako could rest. When she was alone, Sadako buried her face in a pillow and cried for a long time. She had never before felt so lonely and so miserable. And that's the end of chapter four. This is the story of Sadako and the Thousand Paper Cranes, and this is chapter five. Chapter five is called The Golden Crane. The next morning, Sadako woke up suddenly. She listened for the familiar sounds of her mother making breakfast, but there were only new and different sounds of the hospital. Sadako sighed. She had hoped that yesterday was just a bad dream. It was even more real when Yasunaga came to give her a shot. Getting shots is part of being in the hospital, the plump nurse said briskly. You'll get used to it. I just want this sickness to be over with, Sadako said unhappily, so I can go home. That afternoon, Chizuko was Sadako's first visitor. She smiled mysteriously as she held something behind her back. Shut your eyes, she said. While Sadako squinted her eyes tightly shut, Chizuko put up some pieces of paper and scissors on the bed. Now you can look, she said. What is it, Sadako asked, staring at the paper. Shizuko was pleased with herself. I figured out a way for you to get well, she said. Watch. She cut a piece of gold paper into a large square. In a short time, she had folded it over and over into a beautiful crane. Sadako was puzzled. But how can a paper bird make me well? Don't you remember that old story about the crane, Shizuko asked. It's supposed to live for a thousand years. If a sick person folds one, if a sick person folds 1,000 paper cranes, the gods will grant her a wish and make her healthy again. She, she handed the crane to Sadako. Here's your first one. And here's a picture of her friend and the first paper crane, the gold crane. Sadako's eyes filled with tears. How kind of Shizuko to bring such a good luck charm especially when her friend didn't really believe in such things. Sadako took the golden crane and made a wish. The funniest little feeling came over her when she touched the bird. It must be a good omen. Thank you, Suzuko san she whispered. I will never part with it. When she began to work with the paper, Sadako discovered that folding a crane wasn't as easy as it looked. With Shizuko's help, she learned how to do the difficult parts. After making 10 birds, Sadako lined them up on the table beside the golden crane. Some were a bit lopsided, but it was a beginning. Now I only have to make 990, now I only have 990 to make, Sadako said. With the golden crane nearby, she felt safe and lucky. Why, in a few weeks, she'd be able to finish the thousand. Then she would be strong enough to go home. That evening, Masahiro brought Sadako's homework from school. When he saw the cranes, he said, there isn't enough room on that one small table to show off all your birds. I'll hang them from the ceiling for you. Sadako was smiling all over. Do you promise to hang every crane that I make, she asked. Masahiro promised. That's fine, Sadako said, her eyes twinkling with mischief. Then you'll have to hang the whole thousand. A thousand, her brother groaned. You're joking. Sadako told him the story of the cranes. Masahiro ran a hand, ran a hand through his straight black hair. You tricked me, he said with a grin, but I'll do it anyhow. He borrowed some thread and tacks from Nurse Yasunaga and hung the first 10 cranes. The golden crane stayed in its place of honor at the table. After supper, Mrs. Sasaki brought Matsui and Aiji to the hospital. Everyone was surprised to see the birds. They reminded Mrs. Sasaki of a famous old poem. Here's a beautiful picture of the cranes hanging from the ceiling in the hospital. The poem says, out of colored paper cranes come flying into our house. Mitsui and Aiji liked the golden crane best, but Mrs. Sasaki chose the tiniest one made of fancy green paper with pink parasols on it. 
This is my choice, she said, because small ones are the most difficult to make. After visiting hours, it was lonely in the hospital room. So lonely that Sadako folded more cranes to keep her up her courage. Eleven, I wish I'd get better. Twelve, I wish I'd get better. And that's the end of chapter five. This is the story of Sadako and the Thousand Paper Cranes, and this is our chapter six, which is titled Kenji. Everyone saved paper for, Sid for Sadako's good luck cranes. Shizuko brought colored paper from the bamboo class. Father saved every scrap from the barber shop. Even nurse Yas Yasunaga gave Sadako the wrappings from packages of medicine. And Masahiro hung every one of the birds as he had promised. Sometimes he strung many on one thread. The biggest cranes flew alone. During the next few months, there were times when Sadako felt almost well. However, Dr. Numata said it was best for her to stay in the hospital. By now, Sadako realized that she had leukemia, but she also knew some patients had recovered from the disease. She never stopped hoping that she would get well too. On good days, Sadako was busy. She did her homework, wrote letters to friends and pen pals, and amused herself and visitors with games and riddles and songs. In the evenings, she always made paper cranes. Her flock grew to over 300. Now the birds were perfectly folded. Her fingers were sure and worked quickly without any mistakes. Gradually, the atom, atom bomb disease took away Sadako's energy. She learned about pain. Sometimes throbbing headaches stopped her from reading and writing. At other times, her bones seemed to be on fire and more dizzy spells came. Often she was too weak to do anything but sit by the window and look longingly out at the maple tree in the courtyard. She would stay there for hours holding the golden crane in her lap. Sadako was feeling especially tired one day when your nurse Yasunaga wheeled her out onto the porch for some sunshine. There, Sadako saw Kenji for the first time. He was nine and small for his age. Sadako stared at him in his thin face and shining dark eyes. Here's a picture of Sadako and her new friend, Kenji. Hello, I'm Sadako, she said. Kenji answered in a low, soft voice. Soon the two were talking like old friends. Kenji had been in the hospital for a long time, but he had, a, but he had few visitors. His parents were dead, and he'd been living with an aunt in a nearby town. She's so old that she comes to see me only once a week, Kenji said. I read most of the time. Sadako turned away at the sad look on Kenji's face. It doesn't really matter, he went on with a weary sigh, because I'll die soon. I have leukemia from the bomb. But you can't have leukemia, Sadako said. You weren't even born then. That isn't important, Kenji said. The poison was in my mother's body, and I got it from her. Sadako wanted so much to comfort him, but she didn't know what to say. Then she remembered the cranes. You can make paper cranes like I do, she said, so that, that a miracle can happen. I know about the cranes, Kenji replied, but it's too late. Even the gods can't help me now. Just then, your, your nurse Yasunaga came in to the, from the porch. Kenji, she said sternly, how do you know such things? He gave her a sharp look. I just know, and besides, I can read my blood count on the chart. Every day, it gets worse. The nurse was flustered. What a talker, she said. You're tying yourself, and she wheeled Kenji inside. Back in her room, Sadako was thoughtful. She tried to imagine what it would be like to be ill and have no family. Kenji was brave, that's all. She made a big crane out of her prettiest paper, and she sent it across the hall to his room. Perhaps it would bring him luck. Then she folded some more birds for her flock. 398. 399. One day, Kenji didn't appear on the porch. Late that night, Sadako heard the rumble of a bed being rolled down the hall. Your nurse Yasunaga came to tell her that Kenji had died. Sadako turned to the wall and let the tears come. After a while, she felt the nurse's gentle hand on her shoulder. Let's sit by the window and talk. Nurse Yasunaga said in a kind voice. When Sadako finally stopped sobbing, she looked at the moonlight sky. Do you think that Kenji is up there in the star island? Wherever she, he is, I'm sure that he's happy now, the nurse said. He has shed that tired and sick body, and his spirit is free. Sadako was quiet, listening to the leaves and the maple tree rustle in the wind. Then she said, I'm going to die, die next, aren't I? 
Of course not, Nurse Yasunaga answered with a firm shake of her head, and she spread some colored paper on Sudeiko's bed. Come, and let me see you fold another paper crane before you go to sleep. And after you finish 1,000 birds, you will live to be an old, old lady. Sudeiko tried hard to believe that. She carefully folded cranes and made the same wish. 463, 464. And this is a, story, a picture of her with her nurse at the window. And this is the end of this chapter. This is the story of Sudeiko and the Thousand Paper Cranes, and this is Chapter 7. It's called Hundreds of Wishes. June came with its long, endless rains. Day after day, the sky was gray as rain spattered against the windows. Rain dripped steadily from the leaves of the maple tree. Soon, everything in the room smelled musty. Even the sheets felt clammy. Sudeiko grew pale and listless. Only her parents and Masahiro were allowed to visit her. The bamboo class sent a kokeshi doll to cheer her up. Sudeiko liked the wooden doll's wistful smile and the red roses painted on its kimono. The doll stood next to the golden crane on Sudeiko's bedside table. Mrs. Suzaki was worried because Sudeiko didn't eat enough. One evening, she brought a surprise wrapped in a, in a bundle. It contained all of Sudeiko's favorite foods, an egg roll, chicken and rice, pickled plums, and bean cakes. Sudeiko propped herself up against the pillows and tried to eat, but it was no use. Her swollen gums hurt so much that she couldn't chew. Finally, Sudeiko pushed the good things away. Her mother's eyes were bright as if she was going to cry. I'm such a turtle, Sudeiko burst out. She was angry with herself for making her mother sad. She also knew that the Suzaki family had no extra money for expensive food. Tears stung Sudeiko's eyes, and she quickly brushed them away. It's all right, Mrs. Suzaki said soothingly. She cradled Sudeiko in her arms. You'll be better soon, maybe when the sun comes out again. And here's a picture of Sudeiko with her mom, and the doll is in the background there with her golden crane. Sudeiko leaned against her mother and listened to her read from a book of poems. When Masahiro came, Sudeiko was calmer and happier. He told her news from school and ate some of the special dinner. Before Masahiro left, he said, Oh, I almost forgot. Aiji sent you a present. He dug into his pocket and pulled out a crumpled piece of silver paper. Here, he said, giving it to his sister. Aiji said that this is for another crane. Sudeiko sniffed the paper. Ah, it smells like candy. I hope the gods like chocolate, she said. The three burst out laughing. It was the first time Sudeiko had had a laugh in days. It was a good sign. Perhaps the golden crane's magic was beginning to work. She smoothed out the paper and she folded a bird, 541. But she was too tired to make more. Sudeiko stretched out on the bed and closed her eyes. As Mrs. Suzaki tiptoed out of her room, she whispered a poem she used to say when Sudeiko was litter, little. O oh, flock of heavenly cranes, cover my child with your wings. And that's the end of chapter seven. This is the story of Sudeiko and the Thousand Cranes, and this is chapter eight. It's called Last Days. Near the end of July, it was warm and sunny. Sudeiko seemed to be getting better. I'm over halfway to 1,000 cranes, she told Masahiro, and something good is going to happen. And it did. Her appetite came back, and much of the pain went away. Dr. Numata was pleased with her progress and told Sudeiko she could go home for a visit. That night, Sudeiko was so excited that she couldn't sleep. To keep the magic working, she made more cranes, 621, 622. It was wonderful to be home with the family for Obon, the biggest holiday of the year. It was a special celebration for spirits of the dead who returned to visit those that they had loved on Earth. Mrs. Suzaki and Mitsui had scrubbed and swept the, uh, swept the house until it shone. Fresh flowers brightened the table. Sudeiko's golden crane and Kokeshi doll were there too. The air was filled with smell of delicious holiday food. Dishes of bean cakes and rice balls had been placed on the altar shelf for ghostly visitors. That night, Sudeiko watched her mother push, put a lantern outside so that the spirits could find their way in the dark. She let out a happy sigh. Perhaps. Just perhaps she was home to stay. 
For several days, a steady stream of friends and relatives came to call on the Suzaki family. By the end of the week, Sadako was pale and tired again. She could only sit quietly and watch the others. Sadako certainly has good manners now, Mr. Suzaki said. Obachan's spirit must be pleased to see how ladylike her granddaughter has become. How can you say that, Mrs. Suzaki cried. I would really rather have our lively Sadako back. And she dabbed her eyes and hurried into the kitchen. And here's a picture of Sadako and her mom. As if I'm making everyone sad, Sadako thought. She wished she could suddenly turn to her old self. Her mother would be happy then. As if he knew what was in Sadako's mind, her father said gruffly, There now, don't worry. After a good night's rest, you'll feel fine. But the next day, Sadako had to return to the hospital. For the first time, she was glad to be in the quiet hospital room. Her parents sat behind the, beside the bed for a long time, and every now and then Sadako drifted off into a strange kind of half-sleep. When I die, she said dreamily, will you put my favorite bean cakes on the altar for my spirit? Mrs. Suzaki could not speak. She took her daughter's hand and held it tightly. Hush, said Mr. Suzaki in a funny voice. That will not happen for many, many years. Don't give up now, Sadako-chan. You have to make a few hundred more cr cranes. Nur Nurse Yasunaga gave Sadako medicine that helped her rest. Before her eyes closed, Sadako reached out to the golden crane. I will get better, she murmured to the Kokeshi doll, and someday I'll race like the wind. From then on, Dr. Numata gave Sadako blood transfusions, or shots, almost every day. I know it hurts, he said, but we must keep trying. Sadako nodded. She never complained about the shots and almost constant pain. A bigger pain was growing deep inside of her, and it was the fear of dying. She had to fight it as well as the disease, and the golden crane helped. It reminded Sadako that there was always hope. Mrs. Suzaki spent more and more time at the hospital. Every afternoon, Sadako listened for the familiar slap-slap of her plastic slippers in the hall. All visitors had to put on yellow slippers at the door, but Mrs. Suzaki's made a special sound. Sadako's heart ached to see her mother's face lined with worry. The leaves on the maple tree were turning rust and gold when the family came for one last visit. I.G. and Sadako handed Sadako a big box wrapped with gold paper and tied with a red ribbon. Slowly, Sadako opened it. Inside was something her mother had always wanted for her, a silk kimono with cherry blossoms on it. Sadako felt her hot tears blur her eyes. Why did you do it, she asked, touching the soft cloth. I'll never be able to wear it, and silk costs so much money. Sadako-chan, her father said gently, your mother stayed up late last night to finish sewing it, so try it on for her. With a great effort, Sadako lifted herself out of bed. Mrs. Suzaki helped to put on the kimono and to tie the sash. Sadako was glad her swollen legs didn't show. Unsteadily, she limped across the room and sat in her chair by the window. Here's a picture of Sadako trying on her kimono with her parents and family. At that moment, Chizuko came in. Dr. Numata had given her permission to visit for a short time. She stared at Sadako in surprise. You look better in that outfit than in school clothes, she said. Everyone laughed. Then I'll wear it to class every day when I'm well again, she joked. Mitsui and Aiji giggled at the idea. For a little while, it was almost like the good times they used to have at home. They played word games and sang Sadako's favorite songs. Meanwhile, she sat stiffly in the chair, trying not to show the pain that it caused her. But it was worth the pain. When her parents left, they looked almost cheerful. Before she went to sleep, Sadako managed to fold only one paper crane. 644. It was the last one she ever made. And that's the end of this chapter. This is the story of Sadako and the Thousand Paper Cranes. And this is our last and final chapter, chapter nine. Chapter nine is called Racing with the Wind. As Sadako grew weaker, she thought more about death. Would she live on a heavenly mountain? Did it hurt to die? Or was it like falling asleep? If only I could forget about it, Sadako thought, but it was like trying to stop the rain from falling. As soon as she concentrated on something else, de death crept back into her mind. Toward the middle of October, Sadako last lost track of days and nights. Once she was awake, she saw her mother crying. Don't cry, she begged. Please don't cry. Sadako wanted to say more, but her mouth and her tongue were, wouldn't move. 
A tear slid down her cheek. She had brought her mother so much grief, and all Sadako could do now was make paper cranes and hope for a miracle. She fumbled with a piece of paper. Her fingers were too clumsy to fold it. I can't even make a crane, she said to herself. I've turned into a real turtle. Quickly, quickly, Sadako tried with all of her strength to fold the paper before she was swept into darkness. It might have been minutes or hours later that Dr. Numata came and felt Sadako's forehead. He gently took the paper out of her hands. She barely heard him say, it's time to rest. You can make more birds tomorrow. Sadako gave a faint nod. Tomorrow. Tomorrow seemed like such a long way off. The next time she awoke, the family was there. Sadako smiled at them. She was part of that warm, loving circle where she would always be. Nothing could ever change that. Already lights were dancing behind her eyes. Sadako slid, slid a thin, trembling hand to touch the golden crane. Life was slipping away from her, but the crane made Sadako feel strong inside. She looked at her flock hanging from the ceiling. As she watched, the light autumn breeze made the birds rustle and sway. They seemed to be alive and flying through the open window. How beautiful and free they were. Sadako sighed and closed her eyes, and she never woke up. And here's the picture of Sadako looking at all of the cranes that she made. That's the end of this story. Sadako Sasaki died October 25th of 1955. Her classmates folded 356 cranes so that 1,000 were buried with Sadako. In a way, she got her wish. She will live on in the hearts of people for a long time. After the funeral, the bamboo class collected Sadako's letters and published them in a book. They called it Kokeshi after the doll that they had given Sadako while she was in the hospital. The book was sent around Japan and soon everyone knew about Sadako and her thousand paper cranes. Sadako's friends began to dream of building a monument to her and to all children who were killed by the atom bomb. Young people throughout the country helped collect money for the project. Finally, their dream came true. In 1958, a statue was unveiled in the Hiroshima Peace Park. There is Sadako standing on top of a granite mountain of paradise. She is holding a golden crane in outstretched hands. A folded crane club was organized in her honor. Members still place thousands of cranes each year beneath Sadako's statue on August 6th, Peace Day. They make a wish too, and their wish is engraved on the base of the statue. This is our cry. This is our prayer. Peace in the world.